I think it was two weeks ago now, wasn't it, that we had our gingerbread house making event and we had a trivia contest. And the question was, what is the number one Christmas song on the charts? And the, the true answer was, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. That was the true one. And now I realise why we had that. That's to prepare us for the fact that we're actually going to now, with this weather, introduce that as a song for our carols. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, because I think that's going to be next. It was in Tasmania, and soon the uh, snow will be here, and we'll be able to sing that song. Uh, it's just uh, bizarre, isn't it? Uh, here we are in December with this uh, cold weather. We'll have to put the heaters on soon. Um, let's pray and look at this word together. An unusual word, a challenging word as usual, that we would grow in knowledge of salvation. Uh, loving Father, we pray now as we turn our minds to this word, we pray, Father, that you would prepare our hearts and minds for the arrival of our King and that we would uh, repent of our sin and, Father, that you would convict us of that sin and give us the courage to do that. We pray, Father, that your word would enlighten and enliven our spirits that we would know the truth of your plan of salvation. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's the song that you might be familiar with called uh, Because He Lives. And there's a line in that song where it says, how sweet it is to hold a newborn baby and to think of all the joy and pride he brings. And apparently when that song was written, it was written because... Um, the grandparents were holding their newborn baby and sung that song and, of course, spoke about the future uh, hope that he has because he lives. And um, it's so true, isn't it, uh, to look at a baby and the, the joy and the pride that that brings and to think of this new life and the possibilities of what he or she could become. I mean, they're so... Uh, they're young and helpless, but uh, their future could be anything, you know. And, uh, and you stare at them and you try and stare your love into their eyes to know, so that they would know that they are loved and help them to feel that love. And you wonder what they'll become. Perhaps they'll be great. Perhaps this child would become the Prime Minister of Australia or the American President. Uh, perhaps um, the child would become captain of the Australian cricket team. Who knows? Mate, will they be popular? Will they blitz the HSC? Who knows? And you wonder what the child will become and the future. And as they grow and they start to develop, and you say to you things like, oh, look, he's building a tower with building blocks. He's going to be an engineer. Or um, doesn't she love to dance? She's going to be an entertainer. And you're thinking about the future that this child brings. The Gospel of Luke begins by recounting the birth of not one, but two children with high hopes. There is a lot of adoring and singing going on in these first few chapters of the Gospel of Luke. And just as the birth of a child is a new beginning, so the, uh, the, the birth of these children held a new beginning for God's people. The clouds of the past are being lifted and the promise of the future is arising. The two children, of course, are John and Jesus, who are related to each other through Elizabeth and Mary. The first chapter of Luke is an infancy narrative, but surprisingly about John, not Jesus. I mean, you come to the Gospel of Luke expecting to hear about Jesus, but this is about John, and I think... It's difficult to understand the significance of this chapter for two reasons. Firstly, we tend to read the scriptures hunting for truths about personal salvation, but much of the language here is about hope for a nation, Israel. And secondly, we expect to learn about Jesus, but this passage is about John. And you say to yourself, well, who is John? Isn't he a relatively minor character? Does it really make a difference to your understanding of the gospel to know about John? Well, we should assume that Luke knew what he was doing and had a limited supply of papyrus. 
He wouldn't have included this birth narrative, let alone started his gospel with it, if he didn't think it was significant. John the Baptist is an indispensable part of God's plan of salvation, and his father Zechariah tells us why. In fact, his ability to speak was restored for this purpose. So, to us, a child is born, a son is given, but in this part of the scriptures, it's not Christ, and it's not a saviour, and he's not the king, and he's not to be worshipped, he's John. Who is John? Well, the first clue is the name, John. There was no compromise. This is what he was to be called. He's to be called John. John was born to Zechariah and Elizabeth, who were advanced in age and had no children. They may have settled for the fact that they would remain childless until Zechariah was addressed by an angel, Gabriel, in the temple where he served as a priest. And the angel reveals that the couple are going to have a son, that he is to be called John, and that he will be great in the Lord's sight. He was to be set apart to turn hearts, and in chapter 1, verse 17, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah dared to ask the angel how this would be possible, considering his age, and for this, for this questioning, his ability to speak was taken away from him, and he became mute. And lo and behold, Elizabeth fell pregnant and had a child, and it looked like the promise from Gabriel had come true. When it came time for John's circumcision, as per the Jewish tradition, John almost, almost received the wrong name. Remember, his father Zechariah couldn't speak, so he had no way of relaying the message of what he was to be called. And short of instruction from the father, they were going to do follow the tradition and call him Zechariah Jr. There's nothing wrong with Zechariah. It's a per perfectly fine name. It means the Lord is renowned. That would be a good name too. However, naming in the Bible is critical. Who names? It's the parent's right to name a child, whatever the parent chooses. And it's an insult to turn around and call the child something else. If the child's called Timothy, he's Timothy, not Tim. Jonathan, Jonathan, not John, until you're given permission, of course, to change the name. But it's the parent's right to name the child. John is given the name, but not by his father, but by God. Because John was set apart for God and is to be named by God, not anyone else. And even Zachariah's muteness does not get in the way of God's plans, which are detailed down to the even, even to the names of the key players. Zechariah couldn't convey his wish verbally, but he was given a tablet on which he wrote, he shall be called John. At which point he's miraculously healed, he receives back his ability to speak, he shall be called John. John means the Lord is gracious. The Lord shows grace in a way that you and I can't. We can show kindness and love, but we cannot extend grace toward each other the way God does. In Hebrew, the word grace means to stoop in kindness. It's the kindness of a superior to an inferior. The Lord has ultimate power to withhold or extend his grace. And we are nothing without his grace. He stoops down in kindness to meet our needs. In Psalm 84 we read, The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. So the size of the grace depends on three things. Firstly, the bigness of the giver. And secondly, the smallness of the receiver. And then thirdly, the bigness of the gift. God's grace is strong. God has stooped down to give us everything we need in his son. We are people of grace. And John would be an instrument of that grace. 
And Zechariah's voice is restored for the purpose of prophecy to announce John's purpose in God's plan of salvation. God is about to visit his people to redeem, to free and to save them. And the Lord is about to act in a way uh, that he has in the past. And we all want to know the future. How do we know the future? What will happen in the future? Well, there's the saying by an anonymous person, all the best ones are by anonymous people, that the best predictor of the future is past behaviour. Proverbs being proved correct time and time again. And when thinking of the future, don't listen to the futurist. Listen to the historian, the historian, the one that tells you what happened in the past, because history provides the clues for the future. And the scriptures speak about how God has acted in the past. Why? To show how he will act in the future. Because God is, is consistent. The same today, yesterday, tomorrow and forevermore. History gives us confidence of how God will act in the future. The history of God's people revolves around two major covenants in the Old, covenant, uh, Old Testament uh, and Zechariah remembers both of them. Firstly, the covenant of David. God promised a saviour, a descendant of King David, the Messiah. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, we read about this descendant where the Lord says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's clearly the promise that Zechariah has on mind when he declares in Luke chapter 1 verse 69 if you have your Bibles open there look there at chapter 1 verse 69 Zechariah prophesies he has raised up a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David a horn is a king God's people were constantly under threat of enemies enemies who wanted to take away their independence their freedom and even their faith God's people would often look back to the great King David and how he led God's people in victory. Think of David and Goliath. David was God's blessing on Israel and the promised assurance that the enemies would not prevail forever and that relief from torment would come, but only, only when the descendant of David was on the throne. And then the second is the covenant to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, the Lord promised to make Abraham's descendants into a great nation, blessed by God and ultimately protected. He said, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. God would treat people according to how they treated Abraham's descendants. Abraham had the same doubt that Zechariah did because he was old and childless. And the Lord kept his promise to Abraham. He eventually had a child which set the nation of Israel into motion. The Lord also promised him a vast amount of land for his descendants, the promised land. But that was one promise that he'd never see. His descendants would be strangers in the country for four, over 400 years where they'd be mistreated. It turns out to be Egypt. However, the Lord promised in, uh, we read about this in Genesis 17, before those events, you will come out with great possessions. And the history shows that the Lord remembered his covenant to Abraham. And the story of the Exodus is summed up by Zechariah. It doesn't actually mention that, but it's definitely the story of the Exodus. Look there at verse 72. To show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, Genesis 17, that you will come out with great possessions, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. The Lord came good on his promise. He rescued his people from Egypt and brought them to Sinai what, for what purpose? Where they were free to worship and to serve him without fear. And then Zechariah recounts these events, these promises and their fulfilment. But why does Zechariah recount these promises here? 
Well, the promises of the Lord were unfinished. God's people, people were still oppressed by enemies. They were not free to serve the Lord without fear. And they were without a king from David's line of descendants. What made them think that the Lord would come good on these unfulfilled promises? Well, remember, the past is the best indicator of the future. And now Zechariah saw the Lord would come again to redeem his people and his son, John, would be a key player. And so what would John do? The passage is structured by three infinitive clauses, three verbs. To prepare, verse 76. To give knowledge, verse 77. And to shine, verse 79. The first verb, to prepare, verse 76. And you, my child, John, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Few plans come together without preparation. The plans are drawn up, the foundations are laid, the scenes are set. The Lord is coming for his people and John was to prepare the way. But what would be in the way? The answer is the Lord's heart, that the people's hearts were in the way. The human heart is not inclined to receive her true king. John was to prepare God's people for the beginning of Christ's ministry. Christ would preach the coming of the kingdom of God and John preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance is preparation for God's kingdom. It's not just about living better. It's about turning from our old ways of sin that lead to death toward God, leading, living a new way with him. When we repent, we acknowledge our need to be cleansed and to be prepared for God's kingdom. And in the same way, believers today prepared, prepare for the kingdom of God. We identify the parts of our lives that are unbecoming the kingdom and we repent of them and ask forgiveness. By God's grace, this is more than mumbling a liturgical prayer here at church. It's about asking the Lord to search and examine us so that he can purge sin from our lives. There are some pretty nice people here, but I'm sure that all of us need to repent. All of us. And when we have repented, that the Lord would show us more of what we need to repent from. This is our preparation work. I wonder if John was criticised for being a little negative. I mean, he did call the crowd a, a brood of vipers, didn't he? That's so negative, John. He was obviously not going to win a popularity contest that way. They wanted the baptism, but not the repentance. But he demanded fruit in keeping with repentance. It was this message that got John into trouble. He dared to preach repentance to the king, King Herod. He rebuked Herod for an unlawful marriage and ended up in jail for it, even losing his head. Repentance is not something we do in secret. It will become obvious and demonstrable. It begins with confess confession and takes you on a life's journey. Repentance is preparation work for the kingdom. And the second verb is to give knowledge, verse 77. To give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. God not only provides a way of salvation, but gives knowledge of that way. You must not only be saved, but you must know how you are saved. Many people want to be saved, but they don't care how. When you go to a restaurant, you want your meal, but you don't care how it's cooked. And that's the way people treat salvation sometimes. They want to go to heaven after they die, but they don't inquire as to how this happens. They just think it will. And I hear this at funerals all the time. Relatives speaking about their deceased friend or um, mother and how they hope to be joined with them in the heaven, in the great by and by. 
the other realm, the land beyond whatever. But people rarely ask, how? How will they get there? They just assume that the person's there. To be saved, your sin must be forgiven. And you rarely hear that in eulogies. It's impossible to be saved without your sin being forgiven. Yours and my life is an offence to God and we cannot dwell with him unless our sin is dealt with. And how is it dealt with? Well, we read there in verse 78, because of the tender mercy of God. This is why we need knowledge of our salvation so that we don't fall for the fallacy of thinking that our salvation has anything to do with what we do or achieve. It's purely the mercy of God. God alone has the power to save or condemn and he's chosen to save through Jesus Christ. That's his mercy. So when John the Baptist began his ministry, his main message, and we read about that in Luke chapter 3, he said, I baptise you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose handles, uh, sandals I am not worthy to untie, but will, he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John received much attention. Perhaps it was the clothes he wore, perhaps it was where he lived or the food he ate. But crowds would come to him seeking uh, baptism in the uh, river, in the Jordan River. And they wondered if this was it, if John was the Messiah. But John was quickly to divert the gaze away from himself. He effectively said they should be looking for more than John, more than baptism, more power. They should look for the one who would baptise not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And John gave knowledge of salvation. And you know one thing is it wasn't him. It was Christ. God is not content just to uh, tell us that we're saved, but he gives knowledge of how we are saved. In that way, our praise will be directed toward him and not ourselves or not humans. You will not, if you are informed by God, you'll not say, I'm so glad I lived the life that enables me to be with him forever. I'm so glad that I lived a good life. I was a good neighbour, a loving person. You won't say that. You'll say, I'm so glad that God showed his mercy to me in Jesus Christ, so that you will conclude as Zechariah did, praise be to the Lord God. And the third, third verb is to shine, to shine a light. Look there at verse 78 where we read, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. A dawn from heaven was about to break in. It's the start of a new day, a new beginning. And the light pierces the darkness and takes over. Jesus announced himself as what? As the light of the world, the one who reverses darkness. And this is the light, not from the sun, but from the glory of the Lord. And filled with the Holy Spirit, Zechariah praised God for the birth of this special son. But behind this is an even greater reality, the birth of a new king, a new beginning for God's people. Christmas is great, but I'm sure you're all aware it takes much preparation. We have to get ready for our parties and our lunches and our dinner. We have to work out what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, who's going to come. I say, oh, I'll bring the haggis if you bring the dessert, and something like that. You know, we get ready and we buy our presents and our Kris Kringles and our secret Santas. And here at church, we're already preparing. In fact, we have been for weeks now for the Christmas Eve uh, celebration at 5 p.m. this Saturday. And we've been rehearsing the song for a long time, haven't we? And um, getting it ready and uh, working out how it's going to take place. We've been practicing hard. You can do small things on the spur of the moment, but, but the bigger things take preparation. And the arrival of Christ was big. 
a rising sun from heaven, and it required the groundwork of changing people's hearts. So are you prepared for the arrival of the king? Jesus came into the world to save the world and he will return a second time to judge the world. Are you ready? And our preparation is the same as the first time that Jesus came when John the Baptist preached repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Today, we repent for the forgiveness of sin. Not with the aid of John, but with the aid of the Holy Spirit. We seek not to be wet by water, but drenched by the dew from heaven when the Holy Spirit enters our lives and convicts us of the sin and our need to repent. Repentance must follow baptism by the Holy Spirit. Ask God to show you the ways in your lives that are unbecoming a child of God and to give you the courage to identify them and to repent of them, to turn away from those things and to live new lives. I wonder if you've ever had a friend that won't be told. They're just so set in their ways, they think criticism is another attack. And that sort of person will never change. There's no point trying to get them to change. Don't be that person. Pray to the Lord, search me, try me, see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the ways of everlasting truth. Opening yourself to the Holy Spirit's judgment is not an attack on your person or for the purpose of destruction, but preparation for the coming of our King. John's role in God's plan of salvation was preparation. Preparation matters. God remembers his promises and we must be prepared for the arrival of of our king and now is the time to prepare go and get those last minute gifts ensure you've got food and drink in the pantry rehearse the carols one more time send the christmas cards to your friends and relatives but most importantly repent of your sin knowing that god's mercy is strong loving father we thank you for your plan of salvation, which included not only the arrival of Jesus, but one that would come and prepare the hearts and minds of people, calling them to repent. And today we hear your call to repent. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray, Lord, that you would show to us and reveal ourselves like looking in a mirror, that we would know where we fail you, where we don't live lives, becoming children of God, that we would repent today knowing that we'll be in your presence for all eternity, not through our own efforts, but through the power of the Holy Spirit who helps us to believe, who reveals the truth and points us to the Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose to life again for us, giving us assurance of your great mercy. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And in fact... Um, Remain in the prayer position and I'll continue to pray. <clears throat> pray generally. Uh, loving Father, may Christ be known in our community. We pray for the evangelistic activities of this church, that they would be effective in clearly explaining the gospel. And we look for a harvest of believers. We pray for effective outreach through our SRE ministries, through nursing home ministries, through the Anglicare mobile community pantry, through the play group and the many other initiatives at this church that take the gospel to our community and those around us. We pray for courage to invite friends to the Christmas Eve service that would remember to do that and that attenders will be moved to know more about Christ, the one sent to save. We pray for next year's evangelistic activities, for effective, an effective Christianity Explored course, and for training in evangelism. We pray, the Lord, that these initiatives will be well supported and that uh, we would be enthusiastic about proclaiming your word, zealous to do so. We pray for our personal evangelism, 
Thank you for our individual mission fields and the opportunities that we have to present Christ. And we pray that we'd be ever mindful of people's need for salvation and willing to witness. We pray for Andrew and Abby Buchanan in Taraja, Indonesia. We pray for Andrew who teaches biblical studies uh, in the, undergrad in the um, postgraduate course and for their involvement in the local church. Keep them safe and may they shine your light and we pray as they are geographically separated from friends and family at Christmas time, bring comfort and joy to them. We pray for those in our church who are in need. We pray for Jimmy who suffers from the COVID disease. We pray, Lord, that you'd heal him and bring him patience and peace. We pray for Freddie Ganoom, who has had respiratory troubles recently, and we uh, pray for his healing. We pray for Philip Poole, that he'd have recover recovery from his accident with his hand. We pray for Beres Clark, and we pray for, for Jill Sutherland. We pray for all those people, Lord, that they'd know your comfort and your peace. We pray for this world that suffers from war and sickness and financial stress. Please bring peace and an end to the Russian-Ukraine conflict. Protect people there and we pray for those who know you that they will be effective witnesses in this part of the world in darkness. Pray that you'll watch over those who are ill, particularly from the COVID disease. May they look for your ultimate healing through Jesus Christ. And we pray as people suffer from rising costs, from inflationary stress, please protect the, uh, the vulnerable and those who are on the edge of financial trouble. Provide their daily needs. And we pray for a fair and equitable outcome as the, government, uh, the federal government continues to address rising energy costs. We pray that a solution will be found to ease the stress on our struggling families. Thank you for the joy of Christmas and the reminder that you did not leave us helpless and without hope, but sent Jesus, a saviour and king, into the world. Bring joy at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And please join together in this prayer.